Hi, I'm Dr. Emily Balchettis, an Associate Professor of Psychology in the Social Psychology Group at New York University, and welcome to the Social Perception, Action, and Motivation Lab. Let me tell you a little bit about what we do. Our big question is trying to understand the roots of polarization. We're asking questions that get at why do people think and do things that are so different than other people? Now, to ask and answer that question, the kinds of things that we're looking at are people's decisions and their behaviors. But this really reflects the end of a long process that precedes it. Before we can make decisions, make choices, and act on those decisions, we need to get information into our cognitive system. We need to recall things that we already know about the world. We need to weight that information, and we might do it in different ways. But before that can happen, if we take a step further back in time, we have to get that information into our cognitive system in the first place. And one way that we do that, one way we get information into our system is through visual experience. We prioritize what we see over all other forms of input. We trust in our visual experience in ways that we don't trust in any other sense or any other form of information encoding. So that's part of the reason why in our lab we do, when possible, try to integrate visual experience into understanding polarized decisions and behaviors. Now we go about studying these big picture questions in lots of domains tackling various social issues. One of those that our lab is currently working on is trying to understand the lack of diversity in leadership. Now, when we look at what leadership looks like in politics or in education, in, in government or Hollywood, any other form um, uh, uh, or aspect of society where people are really movers and shakers, what we see is that there is underrepresentation of some groups and overrepresentation of others. And our lab is really trying to understand why is that the case? What perpetuates those kinds of beliefs and then those decisions to support that type of status quo? We go about this in a lot of different ways, one of which is is by looking at adolescent behavior, adolescent beliefs. If adolescents right now are at the brink of becoming the next generation of leaders, or at least getting to vote on them, their beliefs are critical to understanding what is the look of diversity moving forward. One of the ways that we do this is by asking them to draw a leader. We come up with a, a, a way in which for them to generate a mental representation or to extract that mental representation of what a leader looks like to them, and then analyze those drawings. We, of course, also do this uh, in, in other ways by taking advantage of the Facebook or Meta's avatar app and asking them, what sort of hairstyle does a leader have? Do they wear eyeglasses? What's the nose shape? What's the skin tone uh, that a leader assumes? We compile all of these answers and then generate these holistic representations of what a leader looks like to them. Here are just a few of literally the thousands that we have gathered from adolescents who've participated in these studies. And from that, we can get a sense of do they look like the stereotype of a leader or do they not? And what is it about the socio-cultural environment that these children are growing up in and that their beliefs are being shaped within that's contributing to what looks to be far greater diversity in their beliefs about what leaders look like than the status quo? Importantly, within this scope of work, we also give back to these communities that are engaging with us. We go into schools and host programs at New York University to try to build adolescents' beliefs in their own leadership potential. And we focus uh, these free workshops that we deliver um, on, on those needs and interests of underrepresented racial and ethnic minority or low income students. My team does things like uh, teaching them about the brain science and how brains change when we do things like learn to juggle or other new tricks like origami. We give them concrete suggestions that they can use when they're feeling imposter syndrome, and, uh, and talk about the social, psychological, and neuroscience behind different aspects of developing their leadership skills. This is a really fun and rewarding part of our experience within this project. Also within the scope of trying to understand diversity and leadership, we also look at what's happening in the media. Of course, people are consuming media at, at record rates as it's coming to us through various mechanisms. And one of the things that we're looking at is the type of rhetorical style that the media uses when they're describing these issues of representation. Now, one of the most common ways that the media talks about representation, particularly if it's focused on gender representation, is by saying women are underrepresented in leadership. Now we can take those exact same statistics without changing the truth of the matter and flip it around, change the agent in that sentence, instead say men are overrepresented in leadership. 
Now, what our lab is finding is by, first of all, documenting what is common in the media and then what happens to people psychologically if we shift or switch up that kind of rhetoric, what we're finding is all kinds of changes in attitudes and behaviors. What we find is that people are saying that men are not inherently better leaders when they hear that men are overrepresented in leadership. People spend more time to self-educate, to understand what is it that they can do to help shift the gender and racial dynamics within leadership. They indicate an interest in working for female leaders. And when we give them the chance to write a letter to their senator advocating for bills that are currently be being debated in Congress that would provide equal access to leadership opportunities, people write more persuasive letters after hearing that shifted rhetorical style that men are overrepresented in leadership. So this is um, just some of the few aspects of this social issue that we're tackling. Another big issue uh, to us is understanding what's happening within the media when it comes to public health. Now, we know uh, that there is a media bias in various in various aspects of social concern. One of them has to do with the power of influencers. Now, what we're looking at is when influencers, either celebrities or non-celebrities who just have large followings, are endorsing junk food products, what's happening with adolescents' choices? Are they choosing junk food at higher rates? And in fact, we find that the answer is yes, but that there is a disproportionate impact on racial and ethnic minority teens. For them in particular, seeing somebody who's of the same race or ethnicity as them, who's endorsing a junk food product, is having a much bigger impact on their choices about the kinds of food that they want to consume themselves. Of course, the influencers have a, a scope of impact for, for all teenagers, for all people, but there is a greater impact for racial and ethnic minority adolescents. It's though seeing somebody like them is swaying their choices more. And when we try to understand the, psych the psychological or social cognitive mechanisms that are giving rise to this difference, uh, in the impact of endorsements, what we're finding is that seeing somebody who looks like you, especially if you're a racial or ethnic minority, produces an attentional stickiness. It's interesting. It's cool. Our attention is drawn to these people who don't appear all that often in media, but when they do, they're having a much bigger impact. They draw our attention. If you're a racial and ethnic minority a teenager, we think that those images are cooler. And as a result, they have an impact on the food choices that we're making. Now, to go about testing these kinds of questions, we use various methodologies. One of them in this line of work and in most lines of work that we are engaged in is that we use eye tracking. We have a special eye tracking monitor that can record where people are looking without their awareness because our eye tracking sensors are actually embedded within the frame of this monitor. So we can get a precise sense in an ecologically valid way of how people consume media and the impact that that is having on their later choices. We use this technology also when we're investigating another social issue, and that's bias in legal decisions. Of course, we have seen videos of police and civilian altercations going viral in recent times, and these videos are entering into the legal system at an exponential rate. And it's sort of the wild west right now of how the legal system treats video evidence. And we have a, have a very thin understanding of how jurors see or take in or consume that visual media. Now, what we're finding here is that knowing whether somebody is biased towards police officers or against them, towards uh, black individuals or against black individuals or any other social group that we've studied is not enough to know if they're going to show a bias in their punishment decisions if they get to act as a juror. That's pretty controversial because that seems like a truism that that our pre-existing beliefs are going to shape the judgments that we have about people if we allow them to. But what we're finding is that it's important to take into consideration not just what they believe beforehand, but how are they looking at that evidence when it's presented to them? Because our eyes can't only focus on a very small proportion of our of our visual surroundings at any one point in time, we have to shift our eyes around. That means we're missing some of the evidence. We're not seeing all that's really there. As a result, it's what the visual evidence that we have is ambiguous, and we use then our, our pre-existing beliefs to make sense of and fill in the gaps of our understanding. And that can give rise to bias in legal decisions. Another thing that we have been focusing on is trying to understand differences in people's risk assessments. We've been focusing on cybersecurity here as one domain in which people would, be, would benefit by making accurate assessments of their own risk, uh, but we're finding that people don't. 
One of the common ways that cybersecurity companies try to help people to protect themselves against harm is by presenting shocking, scary statistics about the likelihood of being a tar uh, being targeted. 65% of Americans have fallen for a scam. 47% of Americans have had their personal information exposed. One in three homes have computers with malicious software. These companies think that's trying to scare us is going to be useful and helpful. And we wonder if it is. Again, using eye tracking, we find that when people are trying to think about themselves, what's the risk that I might be in harm's way when I go online? These numbers don't mean anything to them. In fact, they're not even looking at these base rates. So the most commonly used tactic to try to protect people against cyber threats is not effective because people are, need, are not taking these numbers into consideration. And we try to unpack the social cognitive mechanisms behind these differences in self and social judgment within domains where people are assessing risk. Another line of work that our lab is engaged in involves exercise. Physical inactivity uh, contributes to the obesity pandemic that we're seeing, but we were wondering if there's something we can do to try to help people increase the rate of exercise. Now, what we have tested and found is that compared to when people are looking around their world naturally, and instead are more narrowly focused, imagining that there's a spotlight shining just on that finish line and that they're not really paying attention to what's in their periphery. What we see is that narrow to focus of attention induces an unusual visual experience. It makes a finish line or a target that they're trying to walk or run to appear closer. And when that illusion of proximity happens, it increases people's motivation. There is a cascading effect on their psychology. They feel like the task isn't as hard, that they're up to the challenge, and that they can get the job done. As a result of the change in psychology, we see an improvement in performance. They walk more. They go out for walks more often. They take more steps. They go farther. They walk faster, in fact. And not only do they do that when they're in the lab and we're watching them, but they do that um, after they've left the lab and they're exercising in the wild on their own, but they give us access to their fitness tracker apps so we can see what they're doing even after they've left our lab. So these are just a few of the social issues that we are really interested in tackling to understand polarization. Why do you and I think different things? Why do you and I act in different ways than other people do? And what is the what are the steps in that information processing uh, spectrum that is contributing to these biases that we're seeing at these later stages? Something I should note about our lab is that it's really important for our lab to build a sense of community. We pride ourselves in, in our collegiality and the sense of togetherness and the help that we give to one another. We work hard to build and hold on to the trust that we've developed. We respect and value diversity. We give every individual the opportunities to grow their skills. They come to us as high school students, as undergraduates, as master's students, PhD students, and postdocs. And wherever a person is at in our research team, we embrace uh, their skills and their unique talents that they have and help them grow in other ways that they find personally valuable. I support career mentoring in all different forms that people's career interests might take. A number of graduates from our lab have gone on to industry jobs. Um, some have gone on into medical school, uh, law school, of course, into academia. Uh, I'm really here to support any individual student's unique passions and interests. I don't have an agenda for the type of person you need to become after you leave my lab. That's up for you to decide and for me to support. We try to build skills in all different kinds of areas to help you grow in the ways that would be interesting and important to you. And importantly, we also prioritize open science practices. We use pre-registration when it's important uh, for, for the advancement of science. We believe in continuous learning, taking statistics classes when they're available. I do that too. Uh, learning new tricks and tools and methodologies and techniques um, when the field brings them to our attention. And of course, we try to use open science framework to post our study materials, our data, and anything else that would help benefit science as a whole. So I hope this has given you some insight into what the lab studies, what the lab culture is like, and um, I hope you have found this to be interesting and informative. Thank you.